Thank you very much for coming. I think some of you were already in Florida. You already heard the extended version. This is a little bit shorter version. So we're if I don't if I'm not blinding but blinded by the end of the presentation. We're going to be doing today part one and on Sunday part two of Raghunath Das Goswami's Manashiksha, Splendid Instructions to the Mind. Uh, today we're going to be doing verses one through five, and on Sunday we're going to be doing six through twelve. So that means that today's presentation will leave you right in the middle of the path, hanging off a cliff. All right, we did bring a, a limited number of advanced copies of the book. Um, we have some there. If you have to leave early, uh, my granddaughter Tarni can send you a copy. We have uh, two volumes of the book, one for meditation and one for in-depth study. And the advanced copies are $20. There are a lot more on Amazon. And uh, if you want to give anything more than that, it goes to our cleaning of Radhakun, Shamakun, Govardhan, which we do every day, as well as feeding the widows there every day. Uh, we also have some more books out on the book table. So why is this book important? Well, first of all, it's what's called a padati. So pada means step and put, and hati means progress. So this Manashiksha of Raghunath Das Goswami is giving us the step-by-step -step progress to attain spontaneous love for Krishna in Vrindavan. And, and I don't know about all of you, but I found that there were a lot of instructions in the Shastra from the Acharyas about how to go from materialism to starting spiritual life and a lot of instructions about perfection and not a whole lot that really talked to what I was going through as a devotee trying to become Krishna conscious. Now, as Bhaktivinoda in his Jaiva Dharma, who identifies Manashiksha as the step-by-step -step guide, and he also says there that Rupa Goswami tells us what to do to progress, but Raghunath Das Goswami tells us how to progress. Now, this book is also an explanation of the inner path of spontaneous love for Krishna. We'll discuss this more in looking at verse 3. But it's very significant for our Krishna consciousness movement because there are people who've criticized our movement. In fact, I just read two, three days ago a professor giving such a criticism saying that Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati and his followers only taught Vaidhi Bhakti, that they didn't teach Raghunuga Bhakti. And that is because of a misunderstanding that Raghunuga Bhakti is only the outer path. They don't realize that there's two paths of Raghunuga, outer and inner, as again explained by Bhakti Vinod Thakur. So Manashiksha is the inner path, and it's the path that Bhakti Siddhanta followed in the Gaudiya Mat, and that Arshila Prabhupada also followed. And we'll get into that a little bit more in verse 3. We have a whole chapter dedicated in it, in, uh, to the subject in the book. Now I should tell you that just in an hour and a half today and an hour and a half on Sunday, we're really just touching the, the outer portion of Manashiksha. We, we can't go deep in the time that we have allotted. So I hope you'll excuse me for that. So Manashiksha is divided into three main parts. The first part talks about the qualification for starting the path of loving Radha and Krishna in Vrindavan. Then there's four verses about going on the path, what obstacles we have to face, and what are the ways of facing those obstacles. And it goes from gross to subtle, going deeper and deeper. And Raghunath Das Goswami uses a lot of metaphors, and his metaphors are a little... Um, 
Well, after my class in Houston, one gentleman came up to me and said, Armila, your examples are very crude. So I said, oh, yes, but it's not my examples, it's Raghunath Das Goswami's examples. So he's chosen examples that really just like hit to the heart. And then there's another four verses about the path in perfection and then one benedictory verse. Now what's fascinating about this guidebook to spontaneous love for Krishna and Vrindavan is that it doesn't contain any high leelas and therefore it's not forbidden to anyone to read. What's also fascinating about it is that everything that's explained can also be applied to the beginner in Vaidhi Bhakti. In fact, everything here can be applied on one level, even by a person who's just been one week in the Hare Krishna movement. So it's, it's a very unique book in that respect. Okay, so we're going to go first through the qualification verses. Now, as the benediction for Manashiksha is that anyone who sings these verses in a sweet voice trying to understand their meaning, will attain the jewel of loving Radha Krishna in Vrindavan. I was hoping we could all sing the verses. Is that all right? Yes? Okay. So the tune is Jagannath Astakam, but we don't change the last line. So you're going to sing the last line as if it was like the first three. Okay, and I like to sing together, not call and response. Guru go stay go stala yishu sujane bu suragane swamantre shri nam nivra janava yuva dvandva sarane saradam vam hitva kuru ratima purva matitaram aye swantar bratascha to be a biya chedrita padaha all together with english oh dear brother oh mind having given up all pride please develop unprecedented and excessive attachment to shri guru to shri vrindavana the abode of cows to the devotee residents of vrindavana to all the devotees on this planet to the confidential mantra given by shri guru to the holy names of Sri Sri Radha Krishna and to the process of surrendering to the fresh youthful couple of Raja. Holding your feet, I beseech you with sweet words. I should also mention that in this edition we have not only the original verses, we have Bhaktivinoda Thakur's prose commentary and the first time ever published Bhaktivinoda Thakur's song commentary. So he's written a beautiful song on each of these verses. We also have commentaries here by Jai Dwaita Swami, Sachinanda Maharaj, Shiva Ramaraj, Bhakti Vigyan Swami. We also commissioned 12 original oil paintings for this edition, which you'll be seeing in this presentation, and 120 black and white drawings, most of which you'll be seeing here as well. So he says we should have great love for our teachers, our gurus, and Bhakti Vinodakura says this includes our shiksha and diksha gurus. And we should see them not just as great saints and acharyas, but as our well-wishing friend. And we'll see this beginning of qualification, this first verse, is all about having love. Not being official. If you want to go to Krishna Vrindavan, it cannot just be official. One has to have affection. So great affection for one's gurus. And affection to the process of surrendering to Radha Krishna, which is interesting to have affection for the process of surrendering. <laughs> and also to be one-pointed to the lotus feet of Radha Krishna. This will be very important as we go through the verses. To have great love to all the holy places of Raja. Again, not just official, not just as a tourist. I remember talking to Yamuna Devi in Mayapur and she said, I used to visit just like a tourist. <laughs> but not like that, with love. Right? People have love for so many places, Disneyland or, you know, the place where Elizabeth Taylor was born or something like that. Or I like to say how they even go to the place where Sherlock Holmes had his office. But he's just a fictional character, you know, and there's a whole tourist trade <laughs> to go to Baker Street. So we should have this deep affection for the holy places. And not only in India, but also here. This is Nuvrindavan. This is also a holy place. Also the holy places we establish in our home. We should have great affection. Don't just keep the deities in your home as some kind of, you know, ornament. But keep the altar clean and, and with, do one service with great affection. Here is Krishna. 
And very interesting, uh, we were hearing this morning about the Kanista Majuman Utama devotees from the 11th canto. Bhaktivinoda Thakur defines Kanista Majuman Utama here very differently than I've ever read anyplace else. So here he's defining the Utama, the top devotees, as those who live in Vrindavan in meditation. And he says, the way we define who lives in Vrindavan is who lives there in meditation. If you've ever been to the Dham and thought, are these all really Vrajvasis? <laughs> so the answer is no. Bhaktisanata Sarasvati says that there are many people who apparently live in Radhakund, but by their consciousness they live in Narakakund. Very good. Yes, in hell. So the topmost devotees are those who live in Vrindavan always in meditation. And he says the middle devotees, and again we're supposed to have unprecedented love for all of these, not just respect, but love, affection, are the devotees of any tradition, whether or not they live in Vrindavan in meditation. And I think that's a really radical, isn't it? Right? Not just respect, but affection, great love and affection. Those who love Krishna should love everyone Krishna loves. What do you think? Hmm? And you saw a very clear resolution. Excellent projector. That's nice. And then what Bhaktivinoda Thakur defines as the Kanista devotees are the Brahmanas who are teaching Varnashram, who are teaching, you know, be a good person, worship God, be honorable in the world. Those he's defining as the Kanistas. So it's a little interesting definition of Kanista, Majjhima, and Uttama here. But love for all three devotees. And then love for the mantras given by Sri Guru. So those of us who've received Diksha mantras, love for those mantras. And again, you get a little sense of the qualification here because Raghunath Das Goswami is obviously aiming this book to people who already have Diksha, to people who already have a Guru. And at the same time, if you don't have Diksha, you can still read the book and profit from it, both to see what the path is and there's many, many things that one can apply on the path. When I teach Manashiksha to a general audience, I just talk about having love for whatever prayers and, and mantras and spiritual songs one is singing in one's life. But particularly to these mantras, not that, oh, it's Gayatri time, okay, where's the things I have to do, right? But to really enter into the meaning of the mantras with great love. And then love for the names of the Lord, especially Bhaktivinoda comments on the primary names. And again, this is, we were having uh, this nice talk yesterday about that when we chant the holy names, not to chant them to get them done, right? We were talking about that. Not just to chant, no, I, I got to get my chanting done because I'm so busy. I, I remember there was a time when my husband said to me, you know, Armila, we're not, we'd hardly see each other. He said, we go to the morning program together, but we'd never have any interaction. So we made a time from 8 to 9 every night, or 8.30 to 9.30, I can't remember, when he finished when his uh, business closed, that we would just spend that time together, nothing else. You know, we wouldn't do work, we wouldn't have our rounds to do. We, you know, I, I, he, would, he had a habit always of fasting all day, eating only in the evening. So I would serve him his meal, and we could just spend some time together. And I was thinking that's really what japa is about, isn't it? I mean, in one sense, we want to be with Krishna all the time, but in another sense, we're working for Krishna. This is a time just to be with Krishna. Or like my father, I was very blessed with my father. Uh, Prabhupada said to me when I got uh, Gayatri Mantra, my, Prabhupada, my father became a life member. Prabhupada said, good father, good daughter. And from the time I was two until I went to college, every morning my father would spend one to two hours with me. We would play games and he would tell me stories and he would squeeze orange juice for me. And he was a, a CEO of a multinational company. He was president of his temple. It wasn't a Hare Krishna temple. But still he would spend that time with me every morning. So this time, especially, especially when we're worshiping our deities, when we're chanting the holy name, when we're chanting our Gayatri Mantra, this is our personal time with Krishna. Right? Of course, we're trying to be with Krishna all the time, but often we're running around the day, during the day, doing this for Krishna, this for Krishna, this for Krishna. This is our time to be with Krishna. So it's something we should have great affection for. It's not another job to do. I remember talking to an initiated devotee who'd given up his chanting, and I said, why? He said, it became just something else I had to get done. <laughs> so not to make it like that. And this is our oil painting for this verse. These were all done by Gananjana Prabhu of Italy. 
And this is a description of Nandagram from the Ananda Vrindavan Champu. And all of our paintings are not only uh, about the Raghunath Das Goswami's verses, but they're also based on other descriptions from the Acharyas and from Shastra. And in our, our meditation book, we have references to those Shastras to explain a deeper meditation on the painting. And, and here's a, a close-up of the painting. Uh, we, we do have uh, six of these paintings for sales, the originals, and all of them were also selling prints. So you could say, okay, well, I have love. Right? So many people say they have love. Right? The Christians, they'll say, I love Jesus. I once had to take a devotee to the hospital on a Sunday morning, and they were playing all these Christian programs, and there was these, this, this minister with these people in a circle, and they were holding hands, and they were going, I love Jesus. Right? And it's true in every religion. People come to the temple, oh yes, I am loving Krishna so much. Right? So I met a woman way back when, like 40 years ago, in the Boston temple. She said, I'm a disciple of Jesus. And I said, well, that's really nice. If, if you hadn't told me, and I looked at your life, how would I know? And she said, well, you wouldn't. It's all in my heart. So Raghunath Das Goswami, in verse 1, talking about qualification to attain Krishna Vrindavan, he doesn't just talk about love, all these things you have to love. Radha Krishna, gurus, mantras, holy name, right? All the different classes of devotees, holy places. But you also have to have two more things. Okay, first one is excessive endeavor. You have to do something. Bhakti Vinodakur says, don't just think it's going to be luck. If I get luck, then Krishna will give me. If I don't have luck, I won't get. He said, don't think like that. One has to make great endeavor. You know, imagine the man is lying on his couch all day watching the football game. Oh, I love you, dear. I love you, dear. You're going to go to work? No, but I love you. You know? Love is action. Therefore, Prabhupada said devotional service. So is that not just devotion and not just service? Devotional service. So is that enough? Now we have love and we have action. No, it's not enough. It's not enough. Sada damvan hitva. Always give up pride. With pride, there is no love. So I always give this example. You have $20, you go to Walmart, you buy something, it's worth $5. You find out when you get back, it was only worth $5. How do you feel? Cheated. You, spend, you take $20, you go to Walmart, you get something that's worth $20. How do you feel? Eh. What do they call? Meh. Meh. You have $20, you go to Walmart, you buy something, you come home, you find it's worth $100. How do you feel? Woohoo! Our feeling of happiness is in direct, inverse proportion to our feeling of deservedness. The more I feel I deserve something, the less pleasure I get from it. So if you come home, your wife's made a 40-course meal, and she's cleaned the whole house, and she's wearing her best clothes, and she has perfume, and she says, Oh, hello, dear. Well, of course she does that. She's my wife. She's supposed to. Right? So when you think, I deserve, when you think, I deserve, you can't even enjoy something. And when we think we deserve, almost everything is less than what we think we deserve, isn't it? So without humility, there's no love. Nice explained in the Brihad Bhagavatamrita, that humility and prema, they go together. So here, first verse, he's saying, sada dam vanhitva, we have to give up this pride Sada, always, or completely, and you can say, well, Amrita, that's a pretty high bar, completely. Hmm. That's a pretty high bar. But at this point, we're not really talking about completely, completely, completely. Oops, sorry about that. I jumped here. Nothing about, nothing like technology. We love technology sometimes. Yes. Oops. Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. Terrible, terrible. There we go. That was what I wanted... Um, we're not talking about completely because this is just verse one. So we're talking about completely in terms of a beginner. You understand? As much completely as you can do. Now let's see if I can do this right. There we go. Okay, now we're going to go on to the second verse of qualification. If we can sing this together. Everybody? Na dharmam, na dharmam, shruti gana nirut kam Sachi Suram Nagishwaram Pa 
Pati Sutat Ve Guru Varam Mukunda Prestat Ve Smara Paramajashram Nanumanaha Indeed, do not perform, everyone, any pious acts prescribed in the Vedas and supporting literature or sinful acts forbidden in them. Staying here in Vraja, please perform profuse service to Sri Sri Radha Krishna. O mind, unceasingly remember the son of Shachi as the son of Nanda Maharaj and Sri Guru as the dearest servant of Lord Mukunda. All right, we have some interesting things here in this verse. Ragana, this is a verse Srila Prabhupada particularly like to quote. How is it that we cannot do either dharma or adharma? Bhaktivinoda Thakur says in his commentary, what's left? Everything you can do is either prescribed in the Shastra or forbidden in the Shastra, right? Is there anything left? No, nothing left. What are you going to do? So there's two different ways of understanding this instruction. Let's look at the first way first. So this is from Bhagavad Gita 417, where Krishna talks about three kinds of action. Karma, vikarma, and akarma. So karma is when you're doing the right thing, and vikarma is when you're doing the wrong thing, and akarma is when you're doing, usually, the right thing, but for a different purpose. So what are we supposed to give up? We're supposed to give up karma and vikarma. Now what is karma? Karma is, I am a good person. I do the right thing. My dear husband, I cooked a nice meal for you and I cleaned the house because I am a very good wife. Is that pleasing? Would you like that? It's not really loving and personal, is it? Oh. And in bhakti, it has... What do you think, what of the offenses on chanting does this remind you of? Which offense? Exactly. Thinking chanting is some auspicious, auspicious ritual. And this is the mood that I'm buying my way back to Godhead. You know, okay, well, all right, Krishna, come on. And, and I've said this to Krishna, okay, I have. I chant my 16 rounds, I get it from Mangalartika, I follow the Royal for regular principles, I'm reading your book, you know, what's with it? Come on, give me the Krishna Prema already. <laughs> you ever said that to Krishna? I've said that to Krishna. <laughs> so, you know, this is the... <laughs> I'm a good person. Of course, none of us are really as good as we think we are, but that's another discussion. So this idea that I am a good person, who, who is it can we think of from the Shastra who's been blocked in their spiritual development because of thinking I'm a good person? Can someone give me some examples? Yes. Was it when Lord Chaitanya was having his uh, son to pass on the Jew or something, there was that Brahmacharya who would only drink milk. Yes, good. Yeah, this Brahmin who would only drink milk and he thought that's my ticket. I have to see God because I've only drunk milk. Right? And Lord Chaitanya says, no ecstasy when this guy's around. Okay, who else is there from the scriptures who got, they were blocked in their bhakti because of this attachment to dharma? Daksha. Daksha. Oh, what a great example. Daksha's an amazing example, actually, because when he, he was doing service of populating the universe, that was his seva. And when he saw Lord Vishnu, how did he feel? What's the Sanskrit word? that he felt when he saw Lord Vishnu. Bhava. Oh my God. But still, he didn't attain Krishna Prema. He didn't even attain Vaikuntha. In fact, he was offensive to Narada, right? Because he was blocked with this idea of, I am a good person. Who else? Yes. The Yagyak Brahmanas, yes. I mean, I was just listening to that, that Leela... Was that this morning or yesterday, Tarani? Can you remember? We were listening to the Yagyak Brahmana Leela. I think that was this morning. Maybe you were taking a shower. Anyway, so it was the Yagyak Brahmana Leela. And it, it's really interesting because the Yagyak Brahmanas, they, when their wives come back, they say, we're fools. You know, we're, we're idiots. To hell with all of our everything. 
We should just surrender to Krishna, but do they? Do they? No. It's really interesting. They say we should just be surrendering to Krishna, but they don't. Anybody else? Dhritarashtra. Oh, yeah, for sure. He told Vidura, I know you're right, but I'm too attached to my sons. I can't do it. Karna is a really big one. He's a really big one because he, he says to Krishna comes to Can you imagine? Krishna comes to you personally. Hi, I'm God. <laughs> you know, sometimes we think, well, if I could only see Krishna, then I'd be a pure devotee. The problem is all on his end, that he's not showing up, you know? So, <laughs> that's why I'm not attracted. I can't even see him, you know? So, here he comes and he, he's there and he says, I'm God, surrender to me. He said, I'll even give you rule of the earth. You're the eldest of Kunti's sons. And Karna says, no, I have to. What do I have to do? He said, I have a debt to Duyodhan. Krishna says, you know, I'm Sarvapapa, Bhyo Mokshi, Shami Masucha. He says, no, sorry, I have a debt to Duryodhan. I think of this like it's a, life is a big monopoly game. It's all fake money. But I owe somebody $200 in monopoly. You owe me $200 in monopoly. And I, I can't leave the game until I've paid all my debts. Do we ever pay all of our karmic debts like that, my dear friends? No, because if you pay back one, you incur another. Yes. So give up this attachment to dharma. I am a good person. And give up this attachment to a dharma. The attachment to a dharma is I'm a bad person. So probably none of you have that kind of attachment, but there are people like that. You know? I cheat on my taxes. <sighs> I have all kinds of shady investments, which I use, of course, for Krishna, but, you know. <laughs> so that kind of, I'm, I, you know, I'm good, I'm bad. Give it all up. And instead, because both of those just entangle us in the law of karma, instead come to a different principle, which we'll talk about in a moment. That's the first way of understanding it. The next way of understanding give up dharma and adharma is that, this is nicely explained by Gita 6.3, that the beginners do indeed have to follow the rules of dharma. For the beginner in yoga, work is said to be the means. For those who are advanced, cessation of all material activities is said to be the means. So that a beginning devotee does need to follow varnashram and dharma and all that kind of stuff. And as you advance, you can come to a higher platform. Hmm? Because as Krishna says in 3.18, that a self-realized person has no reason to work in the world, nor any reason to give up working in the world. Now, what is the principle we want to come to? However you want to take this, that we do a karma instead of karma and vikarma, or that we gradually give up dharma as we advance, we want to come in either understanding to what I like to call the secret agent principle. Does everybody know what a spy is? Everybody know, right? You all know what a spy is? Okay, so if you're a spy, you don't just go into Russia and say, Hi, I'm an American spy. You have to have a what? A cover. You have to have a cover. And it has to be a good cover. I mean, I know of devotees who are preaching in places where it's illegal to preach, and they go in as an English teacher. Right? So you have to have a cover. So everything we're doing in the world that looks like dharma, because generally the devotee does follow dharma, dharma antu sakshad bhagavad pranitam, generally we are going to be following dharma because it's coming from Krishna. But we're not doing it because we're good people. We're doing it because we want to please Krishna. So instead of identifying, because this is a problem, you cannot go to Vrindavan, Sarvapati, Vinir Muktan, if we have a new party, if we think, I'm a wife, I'm a husband, I'm a daughter, I'm a son, I'm a mother, I'm a father, I'm a sister, I'm a brother, I'm an American, I'm an Indian, I'm a Peruvian, I'm a banker, I'm an architect, any of these things, and I, we don't have time today, but psychology has shown that everything we do is on the basis of our identity. Every single thing. What we do is we have an idealized self. I am a very good Indian housewife. And then we have this, this view up there. This is what a good Indian housewife does. And we choose what we're going to do based on this idealized self. That's how all advertising works. That's how the politicians work, everything. 
So as long as we're identifying with this world, we cannot enter into Vrindavan. Well, how are you going to do that? I, you know, I'm still identifying with this world. I'm not so advanced. What am I going to do? Too high. Anybody can do this. You just identify instead, I work for Krishna's company. I'm Krishna's employee. What does Krishna's company sell? Krishna Prema. Love for Krishna. Is that a good product? Would you like to sell that product? You get to, you get to taste some of it yourself, you know? You get a reduced price. Plus, you get a commission on whoever you sell it to. And that means everyone you're interacting with, they may look like your husband, wife, brother, sister, employee, whatever, but everyone you're interacting with, either they're a co-worker in the company of love of God, or they're a supplier, or they're a customer, or they're a potential customer. Maybe right now they shop in the Illusion Mart. And so when you're dealing with them, you're dealing with them thinking, how can I do my secret agent business? How can I do my cover business very expertly, work in the bank very expertly, and really do my secret agent business? And then there's no dharma, a dharma, it's all a karma.